Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church. Our purpose is, in all activities, to glorify God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. morning it's good to have all y'all here let's start with victory in jesus 353 let's all stand is what I'll read here in just a few minutes. You can be seated. We'll stand again for scripture reading. I do need to make just a few announcements, and so let me uh, do them while you are sitting down. It is so good to uh, see you in our service this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're glad that you are here, and uh, trust that you prepared yourself to hear uh, from the Word of God today uh, through the wonderful singing that you've just heard and we'll hear more of uh, here in our service today. 
and through the praying and then uh, through the preaching of the Word of God, I'll uh, announce, introduce our speaker here in just a few minutes when the time is right from that. But uh, we are glad that you're here and uh, know that uh, you will uh, hear and, uh, the Word of God and uh, have the opportunity uh, to have it applied to your hearts. Uh, just a few of the announcements. As you know, uh, next Sunday uh, is our homecoming uh, Sunday. Uh, and so we will have uh, Jason, Dr. Jason Jones and Dr. Tom Hocutt uh, speaking to us next Sunday morning. I want to, you to know and make sure that you know uh, that we will start at 945. That's our regular Sunday school time. That will be our beginning of our homecoming service with our choir singing to us. Our theme for next Sunday morning is heaven. And so our music will be aimed towards heaven and our messages will be aimed towards heaven. And so uh, uh, encourage you to come and be with us for all the things that we'll have planned for you on next uh, Sunday morning uh, for homecoming. So that's all the announcements I'm going to make towards the things that we'll have other things uh, going on for that. Um, uh, the, uh, you will see a video here in a little bit on uh, the chosen event that's going to be happening uh, at the church over in October. Uh, the folks that are involved in that wanted me to make sure and let you know that if you can't be in here at 5, uh, it's going to take place in the fellowship hall. If you want to be here at 6 and can be here at 6, that'll be fine. And, of course, you can get, a, get your food then and eat while the presentation is going on. Just make sure uh, don't come because you can't get here at 5 o'clock. 6 o'clock will work also on, on that for it. Um, don't forget the backpack ministry. I see some stuff already out the back door uh, for helping the kids uh, that are not uh, don't have food on the weekend that we're doing the backpacks for. Uh, bring those those items for that. All right, two two announcements that I was asked to make uh, ahead of time uh, for our Kristen and Tyler's uh, wedding is coming right up, coming up on uh, October the twenty second, five o'clock in the afternoon. There's invitations on the uh, back uh, table back there. Uh, you have an invitation to come. Uh, you don't have to sign up on the website. Just like let Kristen know, and uh, you you will come. Uh, so um, it's very easy. Just say, Hey, Kristen, I'm coming. And so, uh, or if you want to get a car and sign up on the website, of course, that's quite all right, too, uh, Kristen, if they want to do that. But Their name won't come up. No, it won't. Everyone from church is invited. Everybody from church is invited. So, so you come and have an invite to come to, uh, to uh, that wonderful event coming up here in a couple of Saturdays uh, from us. And then, as you know, uh, uh, Brim and uh, Mackenzie are getting, getting married also uh, next month, and they're going to have a housewarming shower coming up October the 8th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon um, here at the church. So uh, you, uh, you're invited to that. Have a card if you want to look at it. Uh, uh, things registered for that, so uh, you can see that. So that's coming up uh, 4 o'clock October the 8th. Uh, that's a Saturday afternoon here at the church for that. Uh, also, uh, on that same day, October the 8th at 9 o'clock in the morning, those that can, I know some folks are going to be away on vacation, and I encourage that 100% going on a cruise. Woo, that sounds like fun. Uh, but uh, for those of us who can, we need to do some forward church planning uh, for the fall and for uh, the uh, spring coming up. So uh, those that can, uh, October the 8th, 9 o'clock here at the church, uh, we're going to be doing some forward planning uh, events and things for the church. So uh, those that can. October the 8th, 9 o'clock in the morning. Any other announcement now I need to make uh, this morning that I hadn't done? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, I knew there was one more there. Okay, poinsettias for our uh, Christmas tree uh, need to be done. Uh, we have to turn th them in. Ms. Margaret's tried to call all the folks she could think of to call. If she has missed somebody, please see her today. Let her know that you want a poinsettia so she can get you on the list. So anybody that wants a poinsettia, uh, please let her know. Same price as last year, uh, $15, $15 for poinsettia. So please uh, let her know today uh, so we can make sure poinsettias are ordered. Thank you. Okay. Emir asked me something. He punched me and said, do, do y'all have a uh, children's church? He's looking at all these youngsters we got running around uh, for, for children at any point. I said, we're working on that. We've got somebody. If me and Julie can ever find time where both of us are not running, 
uh, we're working on having children's church to take place after children do their children's corner up here. So that is in the plans, and will happen sometime pretty soon, won't it, Julie? So we're working on it. So, uh, uh, so we're that is going to be taking place sometime in the very near near future, uh, so that it, uh, that can happen. So uh, 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 just be sure that that has been thought about, and uh, we'll we'll we're working on that. Okay. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalms 96. Psalms 96. Psalms 96. All right. Those of you that can, let's once again please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Psalm says for us, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the pe- all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Andy, will you lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us another beautiful day, Lord, that we can gather here and worship you in your house, Lord. Thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon us, Lord. We we don't deserve any of them, Lord, but you're gracious and merciful, Lord, and you, you've blessed us with so much, Lord. Thank you for the continued growth of our church, Lord. We pray that you'll continue to be with us, Lord. Uh, uh, Lord, that we not only grow in number, that, but that we grow spiritually, Lord, that each and every one of us continue to grow and and. and and seek souls for you, Lord. Father, we pray for our country, Lord. Pray that you'll be with us. Help our leaders, Lord, to make the right decisions, Lord. Lord, uh, that you'll uh, guide each one of them, Lord. Father, we pray for our uh, schools, Lord. Father, uh, pray that you'll be in the hearts and minds of each and every student, Lord, and each and every teacher, Lord. Thank you for everything, Lord, that you've done for us, Lord. Father, we uh, pray for our military, Lord. Pray that you'll be with them, Lord. Thank you for everything you've blessed us with, Lord. Father, we pray that you'll be with Brother Caner as he brings us a message today, Lord. And be with us as we continue to go out through our week, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. morning. How's everybody today? Good, good. Let's start off reading a Bible verse today. This comes out of Hebrews chapter 10. It's verse 25. I'm going to read it to you and then see if you can tell me what it's talking about. It says this, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Who can tell me what that means? That's a tough one, ain't it? It's a mouthful. <laughs> you, you, you want to take a shot? I'll read it again. Hebrews chapter 10, 25, it says this. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. It's pretty hard, yeah. Well, I'm going to break it down for you. It's actually a very easy verse. It means this. Oops. <laughs> it's actually pretty easy. It, mean, it means this. Go to church. Go be with other Christians. And when you're there, support and uplift each other. Make sense? The Bible says go to church. Yeah. Be around other people that love Jesus. And, and when you're having a hard day or a hard week or a hard month or a hard year, look to those around you to support you and encourage you. And guess what? You do the same thing. You encourage them. It got me to thinking about my old guitar. Uh, I brought it with me. I figured I'm going to play it a little bit later, and I figured we'd play a song here. Anybody want, got a song you want to hear? Jesus Loves Me. How about that one? All right, here we go. Gee. Woo! That didn't sound good, did it? Let me, let me try that again. Oh, man. Let me tell you what happens to these old guitars. I got this thing right here called a tuner. Let me turn it on. There we go. When I take this guitar home and I put it in the back of the truck in the case, it gets knocked around in the back of the truck. It gets beat up pretty bad back there. And then I get home and I go put it up in the upstairs. And we don't have the air conditioning on upstairs usually, so it gets kind of hot up there. And when that stuff happens, when it gets beat up and it gets too hot and things don't go just right for a guitar, the strings start to stretch. Did you know that? Yeah. And they get out of tune. That's what they call it, out of tune. And when they're out of tune, it sounds terrible. It sounds like that. And so in order to play it again, you got to tune it back up. And so I put this thing right here on it. And I tighten them strings back up just right. And when you get them in tune... Don't that sound much better? That's right. So you gotta, you gotta tune that guitar back up. And it got me to thinking my life is a lot like this guitar. A lot like this guitar. When I go to work, or when you guys go to school, sometimes I get to work and I feel like I'm getting beat up. I feel like I'm getting beat up. It's a hard world out there to be a Christian in, ain't it? Yeah. I feel like it's getting hot. I have to loosen my collar up a little bit. I feel like I'm getting out of tune. And you know what I do to try to get back in tune again? There's a few things. One thing is I come to church. I come to church to get put back in tune. Back in tune with the Lord and try to walk in His ways a little bit better. Some other things I do is I read Bible readings. I read and I pray. There's some things we can do to stay in tune in our Christian lives. One of them, and I think this is what this verse was talking about that we just read. One of those things is to come to church. Surround yourself with God's people. Surround yourself with friends and loved ones who love the Lord. Okay? All right? And when you get out of tune, do the things the Bible says you're supposed to do to get back in tune again. All right? Say a prayer, read your Bible readings, go to church. Deal? Deal. See, that Bible verse wasn't that hard, was it? Let's say a prayer and thank God for that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. God, thank you for the Bible. Lord, thank you that in it you tell us, Lord, to to make sure that we're around other people who love you, to make sure that that we fellowship and we have a good time and we support each other and we uplift each other and encourage each other. Thank you, Lord, for the people in this church and how much they encourage me. May I encourage them. And thank you that these kids encourage me and uplift me so much. And may I do the same for them in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
forget to mark them dates on your calendar. Now, husbands, this is when you tell your wife, I'm carrying you to dinner and a movie, and you're not having to spend a bent dime. <laughs> right down my agenda. There we go. Melissa, we will be there, right? Okay. All right. As Joshua was talking about being in tune, I've been listening to David Jeremiah every morning at 630 on AFR, and he was talking about worshiping in church and worshiping through music. And so many times, he, he looks out there. He's at a big church out there in California. And you look out there, and I see this. I can't sing. I ain't got perfect pitch. You do. God has this little box up there in heaven. And when you sing and do your best, it's in perfect pitch when it gets to his ears. Y'all ever thought about that? Margaret, you're laughing at me, don't you? All right? But it's not. Sing. Sing to the glory of God. Just put it in there and just sing. Nobody's look, they ain't a person up here got perfect pitch in this choir, do you? No, okay, all right. Just sing for God, sing praises. And look, we don't sing too many funeral hymns around here, okay? We try to get upbeat. And we're gonna sing Lily of the Valley as off toward him, and the men are gonna come out there. Y'all not gonna forget let me down, are you? Remember the hallelujah part? So anyway, let's stand up, and if you don't sing, if you ain't tried to just try it. If not, I'm going to come look at you real hard. Okay, anyway, 626, Lily Lily Valley. privilege of being in your house for worship this morning. We thank you for Amir being here with us and we just ask you, Father, to fill him with your spirit here today and give him the words to say that we need to hear. Help us to take it and apply it in our lives. We pray, Father, for those who are sick, suffering, others who are mourning the loss of a loved one in our community. Father, we ask you to comfort them and fill the void in their lives. We ask you, Father, to bless this offering through your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
is uh, my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Amir Kaner from uh, uh, Truett uh, McConnell University. Uh, we have had the pleasure of knowing uh, Emir for several years now. Uh, he spoke to us uh, many years ago. I didn't look up how many when we uh, had the uh, church across the street, which uh, that building is uh, no longer here. Uh, he's also spoken to us when we've had the watermelon uh, shed revival. I think he remembers doing uh, those for us. Um, so uh, we are thrilled that he would come. I asked him some months ago when he had an open date, would he come? And he found this open date and came. And uh, so um, we are thrilled that he would come. Uh, before he comes, I would say uh, that Truett McConnell is one of the few of our Christian colleges left that uh, is a good, true Christian college where you can uh, have confidence of sending uh, your young uh, men and women, boys and girls, and they can get a good education in whatever field uh, that you send them, and plus get a Christian background and uh, know that uh, they won't uh, have their, uh, uh, what we've taught them, uh, undermined there. And so with my wholeheartedness, uh, I endorse and would encourage you to look at Schwitt McCollum when you think about uh, sending your kids off. I didn't know uh, this morning that we have someone in our congregation who's been coming for some time now that is a graduate of uh, Truett McConnell Car College. Laura uh, is a, a graduate uh, of uh, Truett McConnell College. So well, you have someone in your midst that can uh, tell you something about it. So uh, so we're, we're, I'm glad Laura spoke up this morning and told us. Uh, 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 mm-hmm. So, and if you didn't know it, Truett McConnell is not just, I shouldn't say it that way, it does more than just a theology degree for somebody to go pre. It does almost anything you could think of uh, from nursing degrees. They even train law enforcement officers now. They do a, a, a plethora of things for folks. I, do, I just use that word. I looked it up yesterday. No, I know what plethora is. And so... Um, <laughs> things to, to do uh, that, that you would, uh, would want to do uh, uh, in the way of education. So uh, they're not limited at all. So you want to do it more than likely, Troy McConnell will have that for you to do. So at this time, I'll ask uh, Brother Amir if he would come preach the word of God to us. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. We got uh, uh, Yeah, no, let me, thank you. Yeah. Well, after Scott, and get, they'll come and sing this morning. Then uh, Emir, I'm sorry, Emir, I'm, I'm, I did that to you. Um, they're going to come and sing to us, and then Emir's going to come and preach to us this morning. Thank you, preacher. I guess you, you must have heard us practicing this morning. Didn't want to hear Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Yeah. 
there's a roof up above me, I've a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me, I've a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord. sing another special. I'm not messing with you. <laughs> I've got the arms of a thinking man. I wouldn't. We do have something in common, though. We have beards. And I have told the students for a decade, there are two types of men in this world, those with beards and women. And so, <laughs> would you uh, do me a favor, turn in your scripture. We are going to read 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. If you'll stand with me in the reading of God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I want to speak to you today on your identity in Christ. Your identity in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. This is what our Lord has to say to us this morning. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you may be seated. It was about nine years ago that uh, my family did something that was very special to us. You see, I met my wife on a mission trip to the Czech Republic. She was my translator. We dated for a week and got married. Uh, it's a true story, not a recommendation, right? I have two daughters now, and, and uh, if any boy tried to marry them after a week, <laughs> uh, I used to be a Muslim. I, there's enough jihad left in me that that wouldn't happen anyways, but, but it is a true story. And, we, and then, of course, we came here to uh, the United States, and we set up shop. We started raising our family. We've been blessed to be at Truett McConnell University now for more than 14 years and all of a sudden, we decided, you know, it is time for my wife to become a United States citizen. And so in December of 2013, we made our way down to Atlanta, Georgia, an incredibly special day. It was myself, my wife, all three children in tow, and we get to the room. There's 150 people in the room from 50 different countries. If you've never been to a citizenship service, it is a, an eye-opening ceremony because what you have to do is as you get in there, you stand shoulder to shoulder, you first uh, hold up your right hand and swear exclusive allegiance to this country, as you should, as you should. And then, funny enough, I didn't know what they were going to do. I'm watching them. Then they, in unison, sing Lee Greenwood's I'm Proud to Be an American. Now, if you haven't seen fun 
There's nothing like people from 50 different countries of Asia and Africa and Europe singing the country song, Lee Greenwood, I'm proud to be an American. It was a blast. And then she goes up to the front. Every person does individually and gets a certificate. And that certificate is your identity. It's your naturalization certificate. It is most special for someone who comes over here because it is the final stamp of approval that you're not merely visiting, you're one of us. It's an incredibly special moment uh, that my wife had and all of a sudden welcome to these states in that way. In the same way, the identity that you find in Christ here in 1 Peter is Peter speaks to what is called the diaspora. The scattered. Now I want you to imagine if all of a sudden persecution came and you no longer could stay in your country, but you were spread abroad. That's what the diaspora was. And you're spread abroad throughout the Roman Empire, and frankly, no one likes you that much because you're the persecuted. You're the troublemaker. You're the one outside the bounds. And Peter is writing to this group of what were Hebrew Christians, those who were Jewish growing up and then proclaimed the Messiah, Jesus Christ as the son of the living God, they lost everything. They were ostracized. They lost their jobs. They lost their families. And then their own government scattered them abroad and moved them on to what was loneliness. And this form of Christian loneliness is where Peter sits and speak this morning on having your identity solely found in the Lord Jesus Christ and taking a stand for him. Now, you got to remember, Peter's story is just that true story of an ordinary man. We always elevate these disciples so high up that we never think we can live the Christian life faithfully when what we have to recognize is these men were ordinary men. Peter wasn't even the one who brought others to Jesus. He was brought to Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, by his brother Andrew. He wasn't a leader. He was a follower. And then Peter becomes the leader. You remember in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And wasn't a quiet and timid person. By this time, the personality, and remember, God wants to use your personality, not change it. And he uses this brash Peter who stands up and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And what does Jesus do but bless him? It's the first time church is actually mentioned in the Bible. And he blesses Peter and says, that confession that is on me, blessed are you, Simon Barjana, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And upon this rock, that is Jesus Christ himself, the confession that Peter made in him upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And Peter not only becomes a leader, Peter gets to be in the inner circle. See, there are 12 disciples, but you could follow closely and there are three events in the Gospels that only three of these 12 ever get to see. The resurrection of Jairus' daughter, the next chapter after Matthew 16, which is Matthew 17, which is the Mount of Transfiguration, And then they're the only ones who get to go into the deep side of the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is in his greatest state of sorrow. It's Peter who gets to get up to the Mount of Transfiguration, see Jesus in all of his glory along with Moses and Elijah beside him. I mean, what could go wrong? But we know, don't we? We know the rest of the story, but do we? We know that it was Peter who betrayed Jesus. It was Peter who, after being so loud and boisterous and bold, he's the one that when asked, don't you know this man that's, he's suffering for the sins of the world? Don't you know him? And it's Peter, not once, not twice, but three times, who says, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. No one would really buy that lie. And yet he rejected Jesus three times. You could imagine that that sullen moment was probably the moment that Peter dropped his head and said, I guess life is over. All that Jesus had invested in me for three years must be done. But remember, Jesus will never, ever, ever give up on you. Do you know why? For two reasons. One, inside of you is what's called the image of God, the Imago Dei. Jesus placed 
inside of you the image of who he is so you can be transformed into his image. And secondly, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he doesn't give up on you because he is risen. And if there's victory over sin, death, and the grave, you and I can have victory in this life, not merely in the next. Peter recognizes that restoration, doesn't he? You know it. Jesus comes up to him and Peter already knows how grave of a sin it was and how it fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus had predicted. But then Jesus said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Remember, your identity in Christ is not attached to what you do, but who you believe in. And when you understand that, that who you believe in, that he has instilled upon you, then what you do, the Bible says, will not be burdensome. It won't carry that weight. Peter then lives the rest of his life in faithful, consistent service to Jesus. Oh, sure, he would fall at times. But watch the rest of his life. Who is it? It's Peter who preaches the first sermon. Right? After saying, I don't know him, the restoration is so complete that it is Peter who preaches and sees 3,000 people saved. It is Peter who gets to see a lame man healed in Acts chapter 3. It is Peter who is persecuted for Jesus. It is Peter who walks with Jesus for 37 years until finally a vicious man by the name of Nero begins what will be 300 years of persecution by tagging out Peter. James is already dead. Stephen's already dead. And now Peter's, it's his time. And he pulls aside Peter and says, I will crucify you like your Savior. And Peter, in his humility, after being so bold and brash for those 37 years as he walked with God, he says, you can't crucify me like Jesus. I am not worthy to be crucified like him. Hang me upside down on the cross. I don't be deserving to be hanged like my Jesus. And Nero thought, That's, I'll do that. It'll make him suffer even more so. What we now call a Petrine cross, an upside down cross, Peter hanged and he died. It is said that the last words he would say over and over again for more than a year was desiderio domini, desiderio domini. I just desire to be with my Jesus. I desire to be with my Lord. And that Peter brings that victory to you and me this morning. See, Peter bases the entire book, which we read just one verse, in the hope of the resurrection, chapter 1 and verse 3, and then do the hope of the resurrection in in verse 16. He says, now, be ye holy as I am holy is not something that is optional for a Christian and not merely possible for a Christian, but is expected for a Christian. But you know, if you're like me, you take a step back and say, how is that possible to live in a fallen world that is so broken and so dark and so depraved to live a holy, separate life. And he gives the answer in here. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 24 says, there's only one way, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands sure forever. I promise you, your identity in Christ, your life living for Jesus will only be as faithful as reading God's word is for you. In fact, how faithful can it be? The Bible then says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12 that the world watching you would watch you to abstain from fleshly lust. That is, to leave out the sins of the flesh from you. And if you even do that, just that, lost people will glorify your God who is in heaven. That's how powerful your witness can be. But it's not merely for the public life, it's for the private life. 1 Peter chapter 3 then moves on to talking to husbands. And he, he sidesteps that and says, Now, husbands, I need to talk to you. If you don't respect your wives as they deserve, if you do not honor them as they deserve, the Lord will not hear your prayers. It's a hard statement. But then ultimately he ends up with this whole book. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he starts talking about crowns. Do you realize that if you live a consistent, faithful Christian life, the Lord will give you a crown? Now, before you go, I'm going to give it back to him, don't ever miss the gift of God in your life. The Lord literally lists five crowns in the Bible that you can receive. Five. 
If you live a transformed life, 1 Corinthians 9 says, the Lord will give you a crown. That is, he knows that what you do and how you live is difficult, and he's going to honor your consistent and faithful life in Jesus. Do you know in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that if you win people to Jesus, share your faith in Jesus, he'll give you a crown? Do you know if you expect the coming of Jesus again in 2 Timothy 4, he'll give you a crown? Do you know that in James chapter 1, for those who are persecuted or for the faith, they'll, he'll give you a crown? That today, by the way, as you and I wake up in the freedom of this country, because of the sacrifice of so many soldiers over the centuries, that you and I get to worship freely, but 245 million people woke up today that are Christian, and they're going to be persecuted for the faith. The last crown is 1 Peter chapter 5. It's the only crown given not to anyone, but to a particular group, and that's the pastor. The ones who don't overlord, but are an example to the flock, he gives a crown. But I wonder if Peter knew at the point that he said three times, I don't know you, I don't know you, I don't know you. And he thought his life was over because his identity was lost, because he had strayed away from Jesus. He could never have imagined by the end of his life, all five crowns would go to him. All five crowns would go to a man whose life was transformed and was a soul winner and looked for the coming of Jesus and was persecuted for the faith and was a pastor in Jerusalem. All five crowns. It's not merely possible for you and I to live a victorious Christian life. It is expected. But you have to get your identity right. So there are three brief terms in verse 9 that you and I are going to walk through just to ask that. How do I latch on to Jesus and an identity so that my life honors Jesus so much that some will come to you and say, whatever you got, I want. You are, number one, a chosen generation, a genus eclecton. A, you hear the word elect there, but don't go straying off as if the Lord's talking about who he's picking for salvation. That's not a debate there. In fact, if it would have been, 1 Peter 2.8 would have resolved that because it says that Christ died for the world, that he died for both those who would behave and those not behaving is how 1 Peter 2.8 would say it. But this is not what it's dealing with. Chosen eclecton means very simply this. Remember, he's talking to the diaspora. He's talking to the scattered. He's talking to those who are lonely because they may be by themselves or maybe only with their families because they've been scattered abroad. And here's what he said. Remember, when you were saved, not only did Jesus give you all of himself, he gave you each other. No one can live a victorious Christian life without the local body of believers surrounding them. It's not possible. It's no more possible for you as a soldier of Christ to live a victorious Christian life by going about it yourself than it is a soldier of war to go out and try to win a war by himself. It's not possible. What we have seen through two plus years of a pandemic is a great and important lesson. Church isn't optional. It's necessary. I need to be with fellow believers and on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. All these lame excuses really need to be tossed by the wayside. You, you've heard them, I've heard them. Well, I, I don't like church, you're hypocrites in church. Someone give me this one place in this world there's not a hypocrite because the moment you find it and you walk in, there'll be one. But I don't like it, there are crazy people in church. Yep. I'm preaching in three churches this weekend, and I promise you, in all three places, there are crazy people. <laughs> you know them, right? When I walked in, I didn't know the crazy person. But if I were to ask you, hey, name a crazy people person in this church. Now, look, you look at me and don't point this way first. <laughs> I'm seeing you guys here. Don't do that this way. And think, don't say out loud. Some of y'all don't have a whisper. And you don't even know it. Don't say out loud. You got a crazy person in your head? Because here's a hint. If there's no one in your head, it's you. But I'd rather be in here with faithful but fallen believers than out there by myself 
where the devil can simply throw his darts and I have no protection of no one standing beside me. You are a genus eclecton. Jesus is reminding those that came from a Jewish background exactly what he promised them, even in the Old Testament in Isaiah 43, 20, where he says, you are my people, my chosen. I always wondered why the Lord gave me the church where I was saved. It didn't make any sense to me. You, you know, you have city churches and country churches. I grew up in Ohio. We had country churches and redneck churches. <laughs> Lord put me in a redneck church. Here's how you can know it. My pastor was an ex-moonshiner, redneck. <laughs> he was married to a Japanese woman that he met when he was in the military fighting in the Korean War. Her name was Yukiko. This was a country, country church. I mean, we had a German woman in the church who loved to sing country western music. Do you know how weird it is to hear a German accent sing George Strait? <laughs> you know, it, is, it is beyond measure to just not, you got to hold and laugh at this point. And I thought, why? Well, God's good sense of humor. He put three Turkish boys and goes, watch this. You know, rednecks and Turks, what do they have in common? We all fight. That's, I guess, what we had in common. And I couldn't figure out, I seriously, I couldn't figure out why I was sitting beside the person who was beside me. I didn't have anything in common. I didn't look like them in some ways. I certainly wasn't raised like them, being a Muslim growing up. I thought, well, why? And then it came all true to me. You see, when I became a Christian, my father disowned me, told me I'm no longer his son, right? Different religion. And wouldn't you know it, the first lady of the church, Yukiko Miller, when she left Buddhism and became a Christian, her parents said the exact same thing to her. So when I needed someone just to speak life, God had put me in the exact right place. Remember, you may not always figure out why you're here, but I promise you, in the providence of God, he'll show you what you can give others or what others will give you. A genos eclecton is then followed. You're not only a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood. That is, you're not merely part of this chosen family. You're part of the king's family. Jewish believers are reading this and they hear the Torah, the the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse 6, where it says that the Lord promises, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The exact same verse now. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, completes that thought where he says, he has made us a kingdom of priests. Revelation 5, 10, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. Now, here's a couple of keys. Priests are mentioned in the Old Testament and they're really not mentioned in the New Testament, minus here. And they're never mentioned in the singular, and they're not mentioned of your pastor. Your pastor is not your priest. He is not your mediator between God and man. That is Jesus Christ. The veil was torn in two as Ephesians brings it forth. You don't need a priest to sacrifice on the Holy of Holies and on that mercy seat for your sin. Jesus paid it all, and when he says it is finished... It's finished. Your salvation is complete. And he promises whom he has redeemed, he will glorify. So why did he call you a priest then? He didn't call any single person a priest. He called us priests. Like we're a household of priests. If you notice, the book of Revelation deals with it. As a reminder of this, one day in heaven, we will be known as a kingdom of priests because his kingdom comes. So why is that connection here? He answers it in that very verse, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are priests together walking out of here today in order to share the love of Jesus Christ with so many lost people. There's a survey done four years ago that said 51% of American Christians, 51%, a majority of American Christians, do not know what the Great Commission is of Matthew 28 and where it is found in the Bible. They don't know that Jesus said, go you into the world and preach. And I promise you, if they don't know that Jesus said it, they aren't doing it. And in this generation coming up, 
The Gen Z generation now has 72 million people. 57 million are lost. And is now predicted that Christians for the first time since the 1730s, 300 years nearly, will be in a minority in America within our lifetime. Say, so who's taking over us? Is it the Muslims? No, only three and a half million of those. Hindus? No, only a million of those in America. Well, who is it? It's the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They don't believe in anything. They're not going to darken the doors of the church. They're not going to sit beside you in the pew or in Sunday school. And they're certainly not going to come to a revival service or Wednesday night. That is why Jesus said, go. And then bring them in. They are missing the king's family. That our goal is to ensure those who are so loved but lost outside hear the gospel of Jesus Christ by two matters, living the Christian life and speaking the Christian faith. You are a chosen family and part of the king's family. But I want you to notice one other item. You are a hagion ethnos, a holy nation. Did you hear the word he used for nation we actually have in our English? You're an ethnicity. That is, it's not a geographical cut-up. Nation doesn't mean borders of north and south at this point. It means that you are, in fact, he adds to you that you are a special people. That while the demonstration of who we are should be to be thankful for this country, one day all countries will go by the wayside and there will only be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is a called family. When uh, my son, who's now at the university studying forensic psychology, uh, was 15, he turned 15, I want to do something special. You know, you only get one shot to raise your kids. And so I wanted to take him on a mancation. It's only, I only have one son, two daughters. I have more estrogen in my home than you could imagine, but I have one son. So I said, son, we're going to go. This is going to be a time just for me and you. Okay, where are we going to go? I said, the perfect place to understand what it is to be a man. We're going to fly to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is known for two things. One, you can go to one side, and it's Hershey's Chocolate Factory. Yeah, that's what it is to be a man. I, one day, I, it's on my bucket list. I promise you, I'll probably be arrested. I'm going to jump into a vat of chocolate in Hershey's. It is that glorious. How you miss going there. That should be one of the seven wonders of the world. And there it is. But then you can go to the other side when you land in Harrisburg, and that's Gettysburg. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, of course, where more blood was spilled on a three-day battle than any other battle on American soil that we know of. And I, I knew exactly where I wanted to go, being an historian, and I said, all right, son, we're going to walk in. You can walk in. It's a massive, massive place. But I have a special spot. It's got unmarked graves. There are 418 of them in a semicircle. And you don't know if the person underneath there fought for the north or the south. All you know is they love their country and fought for it. So I stood with my son. I said, now for just a solemn moment for a second, son, I want to talk to you again what it is to be a man. And I don't want you to forget it. Number one, it's going to take you sacrificing for your Lord. The number one sacrifice you make in life must be for Jesus or it won't matter in eternity. Two, sacrifice for your family. Son, one day, believe it or not, some woman's going to say, I do to you. And whatever you do, you better have an Ephesians 5 faith and be willing to die for your family, sacrifice for your family. And three, son, sacrifice for your country. If there is some place we need to go in order to defend our freedoms and protect our country and you say, Dad, I'm going, I'll be proud of you, son. Sacrifice for your Christ, sacrifice for your family, sacrifice for your country. We walked away from there and we went to the information desk uh, way around the side. And I said, ma'am, I only got a half hour left. I've got to leave. I'm so sorry. This is a huge place. I need, I need some help. I've got 30 minutes. Where would you recommend I go to make this most meaningful for my son? This woman behind the information desk said, well, I always recommend the same thing. I said, Fantastic. What is it? She goes, I, I tell you, go to the battlefield that your family fought on during the Civil War. <laughs> I 
Well, <laughs> that would have been somewhere around Damascus, Syria, when I fought against you people. <laughs> I can't do that, right? I mean, and we won, by the way. But, <laughs> and then it dawned on me, because I taught church history, I knew exactly where to go. I couldn't believe I missed it. I said, get in the car, son. And it's a, it's a huge swath of land. And, I, and we went up, there was a, a Virginia regiment uh, up on the north side of the battlefield. And we got out, and he said, what are we doing here? I said, this is where a revival broke out. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want you to picture this. These are in all the history books. The North and the South were fighting against each other, and when they came back, chaplains would stand up in the evening time and preach the gospel. And at the same time that thousands were dying, hundreds were coming to Jesus Christ as Savior. And son, what I just want to leave you with is you are walking into one of the darkest days in American history just as they were 150 years ago. But listen to me, God has never done working. He is always at work and he always desires the salvation of souls and he desires the salvation of every soul and any soul that will simply come to him. And don't forget it, son. You and I are a called family. Go and preach that gospel, whatever else you do. That's what he meant by holy nation. Holy has two terms to it. Holy goes back to what we spoke about. You have to have a holy behavior. No one's going to listen to someone whose life is not transformed by Christ. While you may be on different sides of the journey, remember, your goal is a step closer to Jesus every day. And while the devil tries to snatch you up and make you make mistakes, your goal is to faithfully try to walk with him. And they'll listen to you and they'll hear you. And holiness means also being set apart. Set apart in two ways. Set apart that those around you need you, that you have a gift, First Peter 4 says, that you need to pour into the body of Christ, a gift of mercy or a gift of teaching, and they have a list of them in four different passages in Scripture. But also that idea of holiness or calling is a beautiful picture that, listen, what we try to instill at True McConnell University is a simple fact we have a missions degree, we have a ministry degree, we have the largest amount of ministers studying in Georgia of any university. All of that, while some are called to be ministers and missionaries for the gospel of Jesus Christ, every single student on that campus is called to be a witness for Jesus Christ. This world will never be one to Christ if only your pastor shares Jesus in this community. This community, this county, this state will only be one to Christ when we capture it. We who are not pastors and go out and preach the gospel, love on your neighbors, share the gospel, get them a track, call them up, message them, use whatever means and medium you can in order to get the love of Jesus Christ to their home and household. He ends up that you may proclaim the praises of him, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. All the disciples died for Christ except for one. The Apostle John, the Lord had a different call. He was exiled to Patmos where he would write and finish up what we call the canon or the Bible. He finishes up the last book, the book of Revelation. Because of God's special assignment for the Apostle John, the Apostle John lived to be nearly 100 years old or so. And because of that, the disciple John got to disciple others. One of the last men discipled took over for him when he died. It was a man by the name of Polycarp. Imagine being under uh, Gospel of John and all of the man's writings. Imagine being under John being his disciple. Polycarp was that. In the age of 30, when John dies, Polycarp will take over actually for a church to which the Apostle John wrote about in the book of Revelation. Polycarp lives to be an aged man, and when he's about 85 years old, Another persecution pops up in the Roman Empire and they decide, let's start with the older man in the back, the one who's preached the gospel for so long. He's feeble and he's frail and we're quite sure we can get him to deny the faith. Oh, the mistake they made. They, they brought him in, they put him in front of assembly and they said, hey, Polycarp, if you don't recant your faith, we're just gonna throw you to the animals. Back then, the lions and the bears would feed off the Christians in the Colosseum in Rome. And you'd rather be killed by a lion than a bear because it was quick and not vicious as much. 
Polycarp wasn't bothered by it. He looked at him, he said, what are you waiting for? Do it. Well, now they got angry. And they said, if you don't listen to us, we will burn you at the stake. There was their mistake. Polycarp looks at him and says, you, you worry about the fire that quenches in an hour, but you do not worry about a fire that never quenches. And he preaches the gospel. Finally, they say, tie him up. We're done with him. Let's burn him at the stake. And he says, you don't have to tie me up. I'm not going anywhere. After they put him to death, a chronicler writes of the aged Polycarp, 85, 86 years old. He was sharing the cup of Christ in the resurrection to eternal life. Some of the last words they heard him say was this. Eighty and six years have I served my king, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? What caused the boldness of Polycarp but a faithful walk with Jesus? See, he recognized what all of us must recognize in this room. As Adrian Rogers once said, death is not a period. It's a comma. Death simply brings us to our next life. Live for Jesus. Check your identity to ensure you are walking faithfully with him. Not merely for ourselves, but for the sake of others and for the lost all around us. Pray with me. Lord, may it be so. Wherever we find ourselves in whatever school, whatever neighborhood, whatever marketplace, whatever classroom, would we steal our spine and soften our hearts to share Jesus with now 80% of a generation lost? But it doesn't have to be that way. Lord, you've brought revival to our country before and you could do it again, but it will start with Christians taking a stand loving on the lost, and living for him. May today, Lord, as you spoke to hearts in each pew, each row all over, would they do business with you? And if there's someone here who says, I don't have this, I've never placed my faith in Christ, I've never surrendered my life, Lord, with this invitation, these sacred moments, would we be able to see the greatest miracle in history, the salvation of a soul who would come to him? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.